Good evening and welcome back to uh, another installment of Through the Eyes of St. John as uh, we take a look at the end of chapter five and all of chapter six tonight. Uh, lots to cover, but I'm certain uh, that we can do it and we'll uh, be just fine. Uh, is there anyone who would be willing to pray for us tonight to get us started? Go ahead, Pam. Thank you. Nice and loud so that everybody can hear online too. Lord Jesus and John, and let our hearts be open to your word. Use this Bible study to apply to our lives. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. In your mighty name, amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, before we begin tonight, I think it's good for us uh, to review where we've been. Okay, so uh, you know this famous verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And when that comes to uh, us in the gospel, that means that Jesus has come to us, right? John chapter one, for the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory. And then the disciples, beginning with Andrew, and then Peter, and then Philip, and then Nathaniel, they come and find hope in Jesus too. And then Nicodemus comes. He's a Pharisee, a ruler of the Jews. And even if he cannot grasp it, God in Jesus Christ is working on his own people, the Jews, that they might have faith in him. And then we have, uh, in chapter 4, an unnamed Samaritan woman. She uh, is included in the world that God loves, which is a shocking claim for those Jews who thought this was not possible, right? They did not think that it was possible that Samaritans uh, could be loved by God. Well, she finds a welcome and she becomes a witness, bearing uh, and giving testimony about Jesus Christ so that she who was barren uh, as I said in my sermon, now gives birth to a whole community of people, right, uh, in, through faith in Jesus Christ. And then at the end of chapter 4, which was the basis of my sermon yesterday, we heard that an official, likely a Gentile, uh, maybe from uh, Rome as a soldier who was uh, camping out there, but also possibly uh, an official from Herod Antipas, the governor, uh, the local governor in Galilee, comes and asks that his son might live, okay? And there is that key refrain, your son lives, which we heard yesterday in the sermon was an explanation and a, a reminder of God's commitment to life carried out by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the catalyst, but the whole Trinity is at work in this, right? And uh, then we had the healing of the invalid in Bethesda, which we talked about last week, right? And there are these crazy diverging understandings of that, right? Jesus understands it to be a healing. He understands it to be a gospel, a promise, a, a new reality, a new creation for that man. And the Jews, uh, we know is a tricky phrase, but uh, it's those who are opposed to Jesus in the first century. Uh, they see it as a problem with the law, that Jesus is being lawless and uncommitted to faithfulness. And so they attack him for two things. First, that he is uh, breaking Sabbath observance. And secondly, that he uh, is blaspheming God because he is claiming to be the son of God, to be equal with God and doing God's work in and among the people. Okay, okay. So that's what's at stake, okay, uh, as, we, as we come to tonight. And we know that in our Bible study that there are, uh, that this is the first part of the book of John, which is a book of signs. So we know that there are seven signs. You see them there uh, on the screen. And each of the signs follows a similar structure. So first there is the sign that is performed. Jesus does that. 
And then there's a dialogue, which usually includes some disagreement, right? Remember that? Uh, we talked about that. And the Jews uh, go after Jesus, right? Well, wait a minute. Uh, don't you believe in the Sabbath? You can't just be telling people to pick up their mats and walk. And then Jesus has to explain it. And that's what I asked you to read uh, tonight as we begin our reflection. So you uh, were to take a look at John chapter 5, verses 19 to 47. And I'm wondering if you have any insights that you might uh, have gleaned from your reading of the discourse, John 5, 19 to 47, that you would like to share with the whole class. Don't be shy now. Okay, this is your chance to talk. I've done enough talking for a few minutes. Don't forget to mute, uh, unmute yourselves online. There you go, Connie. The one thing I noticed is um, verse 19 through um, verse 29, Jesus is, is giving, he's talking about the father and the son, but he never references himself as being the son in that. He doesn't do that until you get to verse 30, and then it becomes personal. Then it's I, I the son. Um, but he, in this whole 19, I don't see at all. He talks about the father and the son. So it's kind of like it's an overview. And then he gets yeah. into, I am the son. Yeah. Like a and, general and, lesson. Yeah, a general lesson and then the particularity of that lesson. That's right. a great insight. Yeah. Um, remember, too, that this is uh, Jesus um, trying to meet people where they are, right? So they have some kind of concept of God as Father in the Old Testament, and they also have a concept of a Son of Man or the Son of God. Those terms were used in Hebrew scriptures, but they may not have grasped what that meant. And so he's trying to prepare them for that. Remember, this is what what the son is going to do, think about, you know, like Daniel chapter eight, I think it is where we hear about this son of man character, right? And then he goes in and says, oh, and by the way, it's me, it's me. Yeah, it's great. Great insight. Good. Others. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. Uh, Claire said we don't usually talk about Jesus as being a judge. Uh, we don't always think about that. We confess it every week, but we, we forget uh, what that means. And uh, also that judgment looks different than, um, you know, sorting out whether you've done the right thing or the wrong thing, as we have come to understand it. In John, it's going to be all about whether you have moved from darkness to light, whether you have moved from unbelief to belief, whether you have been moved from death to life, and all of that is going to be done to you uh, by means of the Father through the Son. Yep. And of course, the Holy Spirit, but uh, that will wait to get there until uh, chapter 14. Yeah, great. Uh, a great topic. Yeah. Oftentimes, I think we forget about that little phrase at the bottom of the second article of the creed, right? He will come again to judge the living and the dead. And what's interesting in Luther's explanation, it's almost Johannine. Uh, it, it follows John's uh, idea, right? He says that, the, that Jesus, the son, has done all of this in order that I might be his own, live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. So what kind of judge is Jesus? Is he a, ju a judge with lots of wrath, really hammering down uh, the law? No, he, he brings a, a right relationship. He brings innocence through the forgiveness of your sins and blessedness so that you might bless others and thus fulfill the Abraham uh, covenant, right? In jo uh, Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. Good. Great. Any other insight in this uh, long uh, discourse? Actually, this one's pretty short in comparison. When I look at this, I think I always think to this part of 
How would I have reacted? Yeah. Yeah. If somebody came into church and said, This is the way it should be done, what you're doing is not the way in my heart to stop or my heart to harden. Yeah. What what would I feel when I'm used to a certain way of the, the worship service? Yep. Those type of things. So it just always has been just thinking that we always should be open to new things and to learn and that God is the only way. But I always say. Yeah, I'm not sure if you could hear that uh, online. Uh, but Pam said, uh, it sort of makes me wonder how I would, would have reacted. Would I have been on the side of the Jews or would I have been uh, hard-hearted, right, she said, or would I have been prepared to hear what Jesus had to say um, and had a, a heart to receive? And so it reminds us uh, that we have to uh, be praying that God would open our hearts, right, soften our hearts and be open to the work of the Holy Spirit, to uh, maybe a new interpretation or understanding something in a new way. Yeah, it's good. That's really helpful, uh, Pam. And I think, too, we'll get more to this question about belief and how it comes about as we get to the end of ch chapter six tonight. Uh, so keep that in mind because we'll, uh, it'll come back to help us. Great. Well, for the sake of time, I'm going to move uh, rather quickly um, and just highlight kind of what I think are the kind of three main ideas from John chapter five. And the first is uh, the triune work, right? That, uh, and I mentioned this in my sermon yesterday. I hope uh, that was clear to you um, that God, the father, God, the son, and God, the Holy spirit are working together, right? In John, uh, he's the catalyst. He's the, he's the pipe by which all of this gracious, uh, a gift is handed over to us uh, from God the Father and through the Holy Spirit, uh, but they're always working together. That's what I love about this image that's up there, right? It's all tied together, that Trinity symbol, right? They don't work apart from each other, but they overlap. Um, that's the danger, I think, in confessing the creed, that we think they work um, you know, that God the Father's in charge of creation and Jesus is in charge of redemption and the Holy Spirit does uh, the work of sanctification, but actually they are interdependent of one another and constantly working uh, that out. It's so hard for us with our limited mind. Yeah, to grasp that, yeah. Yep. In some ways, I think John helps to break that out, that Jesus is the one who is acting in the world, but he's doing the work that God has sent him to do, like God is the manager, right, uh, or something like that. And the Holy Spirit is the one that's enabling Jesus to do all of that work, right? But even that is sort of a, a an, an understanding that breaks them apart in a way that uh, they really aren't broken apart. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sometimes the Holy Spirit gets the shaft. Uh, in a way, because the Holy Spirit is always making sure that we hear and understand and know Jesus Christ, right? Uh, that's, uh, that's the work of the Spirit. The second thing uh, that I lifted up, uh, that the triune, were, uh, the triune God and the work that the triune God is doing is handing over the gift of life. And the gift of life, uh, really, especially in John, is a threefold understanding. It is life as a creature, right? So that I'm a physical person with a human body, with needs like food, water, clothing, shelter, uh, and those sort of things. And God gives those to me in the creation, okay? And then in Jesus Christ, he gives me the new life or the life of faith. And that life of faith, uh, friends, as we hear in, in Luther's second article, is a life that is received through Jesus Christ and puts us into a living relationship with God and Jesus. And it is experienced in this world right now. Right? It's not something that we're waiting for to happen uh, at the end of time, but it's right now. 
And when we have that life of faith, that life as a believer uh, uh, on this side of heaven, we have peace and liberty or freedom uh, to live in confidence of who Christ is and what he's done for us. And then the third gift, of course, is what Luther spells out in his explanation of the third article of the creed, that gift of eternal life, eternal life, the life that comes uh, when we have died and Christ is going to raise us and all believers with him. Make sense? Uh, in many ways, uh, what happened yesterday in my sermon was an exposition of this scripture text, right? You didn't know it, right? You only heard the sign. But in some ways, my sermon was trying to be Jesus' discourse in explaining what was happening here uh, in God's action. Do you see that? And then finally, of course, uh, is witness. And this idea of having a witness or testimony, which we said was uh, really the work of a disciple, right? Uh, that God sends people to bear witness to Jesus. And that, of course, was John the Baptist. And then the works and signs which Jesus does are also bearing witness. They don't stand on their own. They're making sure that we understand Jesus and who Jesus is. Uh, Jesus goes on to say in verses 37 to 47 that even the scriptures and Moses are pointing to Jesus. They don't stand on their own, but they point to Jesus too, and that in him we have life. Okay? Any questions about that? <clears throat> I, I notice he, he refers to John the Baptist as a burning and shining lamp. Yeah. Willing to rejoice for a while in his light. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, if you think about witness and even as us being witnesses. Yeah. It, yeah, I mean, I just think that's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, that is your work to be a shining light, right? And then the other thing, Connie, is that if um, the danger of that for other people is that, um, and I'm always worried about this as a pastor, right, that people will start to see me as the light, but I'm only the light bearer, right? I'm pointing beyond uh, to Jesus Christ. And so the danger for people is to make sure that, um, A, as one who is bearing witness, that you get out of the way so people see Jesus in the end. Um, and also to make sure, because if you put your faith in the witness, you're going to be really disappointed, right? They're going to let you down because you'll find out that the witness is a sinner just like you. And boy, that's not, uh, there's no hope in that, right? But uh, maybe a witness uh, is like too blind or uh, begging people leading uh, to the one who has the bread, right? Uh, using that old analogy. Really good. Okay. Well, friends, uh, that uh, moves us then to signs four and five, which is John chapter six, verses one to 21. And they are the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus walking on the water. As I mentioned before, in the book of signs, which is really basically from chapter one to chapter 12, uh, there is a certain order to which these stories are told. So the sign is told to us in John 1 or John 6, 1 to 21. Then there's a dialogue with the Jews. It's going to be uh, verses 22 to 34. And then there's going to be a discourse. Jesus is going to teach. Okay. And that's 35 to 58. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to read 69 verses of scripture and try to remember everything that happens. So we're going to break it down, okay? And uh, let's begin with John chapter 6, verses 1 to 21. That's where we're going to begin tonight. And I'm going to put these questions up for you, okay? What captures your imagination? What questions arise from the reading, okay? And then I have a new question tonight, okay? What Old Testament stories or events 
So uh, if you've studied the Old Testament at all, what stories do you hear that are peeking out during uh, chapters 6, verses 1 to 21? Okay, are we ready? I'll read. You do the work of answering the questions while you listen, okay? After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people can eat? He has said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered, 200 denarii would not buy enough bread for each of them to even get a little. One of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, Well, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as, the, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told the disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were to, about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat, and started across the Sea of Capernaum. Now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, I'm going to make an edit here, I am. Do not be afraid. If your Bible says something like, it is I, cross it out and write, I am. Okay, that's what it is. Do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. What captures your imagination or what questions arise from the reading? Now, verse 10, the word, um, so the men sat down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we don't, we don't know. Uh, we know that... Uh, Gene says it's only men listed. Well, maybe that's how they counted. If that's the case, as some scholars believe in the Synoptic Gospels, this could have been as many as 15,000 people. Right? Um, in fact, uh, I'll confess, uh, I've been only counting uh, one device when we talk about people who are online, when we were doing online worship, right? How many devices? And then we'd multiply that by three, because that's a pretty good guesstimation of a household, right? Some houses are only one, some are five. Uh, you average that out with three, and that's how you get your number. So uh, that's been a, a guesstimation. But yeah, there could it could be 5,000 men or 15,000 people in total. Yeah, and anything in between, okay? Gloria, were you going to say something? Yeah, yeah. But they were fed. They were fed after they walked through the water. Yeah, absolutely. Gloria says that this sounds a lot like the Exodus story and uh, manna in the wilderness, right? Uh, it's a little bit backwards because we've got uh, them kind of flipped in the order. Um, but you can think too uh, of Jesus taking the bread 
giving thanks and distributing them, this could be a Passover meal, right? Which happens before. And then you have Jesus walking on the water. Yeah, and then the manna that comes later. Yep. Good. So Passover Clear. Said Jesus Passover was at hand. So isn't that mean that they're in the middle of it? Yeah. It's Passover right now. Yeah. Does anybody have a problem with this? What is happening? Where are you supposed to be at Passover? In Jerusalem, right? At temple sacrificing your lamb and eating the meal uh claire figures this out right she says wait a minute uh if passover is at hand and there's a group of people at least five thousand, hanging out didn't go to the festival in jerusalem there's gonna be a conflict right this is gonna cause a conflict between jesus and the jews and remember the jews is not a anti-Semitic uh, phrase here. It's just those who are in conflict with the way that Jesus is doing his ministry. Okay. No wonder they got mad, Pam says. Yeah, he's messing with the law and keeping the law in its proper way. Good. Yeah, of course we do, Gloria. Yeah. I mean, if you don't show up on Sunday morning, you would have yeah, yeah, and vice versa. I get annoyed when you don't come, right? <laughs> she said we we would get upset if uh, Pastor Cullen didn't show up on Sunday, and I said, and vice versa. I don't like it when you don't come, right? Uh, we have expectations. Connie, go ahead. Um, verse 15, it talks about um, he withdrew because he, he thought they were about to come and take him by force to make him king. Yeah. And that isn't why he, it wasn't the type of king. I, they had a different idea of what a king would be. You right. Know? Yep. They have this idea of the political ruler right. in the vein right. of David. And that's just not who Jesus is uh, in this gospel or in any of the gospels, really. He's, his kingdom is not of this world, we will hear. Right. Um, in chapter 18, when he's giving his confession before Pilate. Very good. Anything else? Well, Gloria's got us on a good start here. What are the Old Testament overtones? She said, uh, manna in the wilderness, walking uh, on the water, or through the water, the Red Sea. Uh, Claire said, Passover. Uh, Connie's mentioned uh, the king, right, in the vein of David. Okay. Any others that you can think of? Oh. oh. Uh, uh, go, just a second, Connie. Go ahead, Pam. Yeah, this mountain, this idea of the mountain at Mount Sinai and bringing the tablets. Good, yeah. Uh, Connie, go ahead. Well, when you had you had us changing the word here to I am. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I am, right? Uh, the divine name of God. Right. Exodus 3. Yep, very good. Yeah, and you got to cross that out. It's bad translation, friends. Right. Got to get it right. Anything else? We've hit a bunch of them. I'm going to start putting them up here. I'm just going to let them roll on and see what... Uh, if we came up with any that we haven't mentioned thus far. The wilderness wanderings, the manna, and the water, right? Remember when they're grumbling because right. they don't have any water at the water at the rock? That's Exodus 17. Mount Sinai, uh, Pam said that one. Anybody catch that? 12 baskets? Oh, no. The 12 tribes, right? Yeah, 12 apostles for them to do it, right? Uh, that And that phrase gather it up so that none is lost right uh that's an important thing for us to remember yeah we don't know what happens with it yeah um but uh it's important for us to understand that jesus is concerned um is he concerned that uh you know they're not wasteful or is there something more about this bread that he's offering 
And does that point to something, right? He's not, he doesn't want anything to be lost, a, aka his teaching, or that he might be able to feed more people, uh, right? That those who are not of this flock, as he's going to say in chapter 10, that they will also get a share in what Jesus has to offer the world. Okay. Yeah. Is it only good for then and then it's gone? Yeah. Yep. The next one uh, in, in Deuteronomy 18, Moses promises that a, a prophet greater than he is going to come, right? And a little later, they're going to say to Jesus, whoa, we, we believe you are the prophet who's coming into the world because you do really cool stuff, right? Obviously, they don't really get what's going on here, but it's a start, okay? Connie mentioned the political messiah, okay? There's a story in Exodus, uh, no, excuse me, in 2 Kings. It's so small that you probably have forgotten about it, but the prophet Elisha also feeds uh, a group of, uh, I think it's about 100 people, and he does it with barley loaves, right? And so you have uh, that indication there. And then, of course, the I am statement, okay? Isn't there also um, the widow or the... Um, yeah, yeah running out of food and yeah the, elijah uh and the widow at zarephath yeah it's great yep you sort of think of her too uh with last or yesterday's reading right of the official and his care for his son right and right. she has this same thing yeah elijah kind of echoes there too good so those are the those are the the um overtones that are there The other thing that's interesting, as uh, Claire pointed out, if this is really Passover and there, uh, there doesn't seem to be a lamb being sacrificed, except the lamb of God is the one who is teaching them. And all the yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And telling the story of what this is really about. Yeah. And that God is working in the midst of all of these things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Good. Okay. So now we're going to move to the dialogue. Okay. And remember these questions that we have. Uh, who are the players? What is the setting? Okay. What is the dilemma or dilemmas that we're going to come up against? Okay. And how is it resolved or not in the conversation? Okay. So we're just going to read now uh, verses 22 through 34. Okay. And then we'll come and catch the rest from 35 to the end. Okay. But for now, we're just going to look at this. Uh, scene in miniature, shall we say, uh, of the dialogue between Jesus and the crowd. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and also went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said, Rabbi, when did you come here? Well, we know the answer to that, right? But they don't, okay? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Such a great line, right? Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set the seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God 
that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the bread, the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, sir, give us this bread. Okay, come on. Are you that small minded that you forgot? I mean, how bad is your memory? It, they, they were just there and they were so excited about what Jesus did. And they go off to find him. And they can't even remember the sign that he's just performed. It's crazy. I just can't believe it. Okay. okay. Who are the players? Jesus. Yep. Always a good Sunday school answer. It's all, the answer that's always right. The disciples. The crowd. The crowd. Yep. Yeah. So far, that's who we've met, right? It seems uh, later on that there are going to be some Jews that are also going to come, um, whether they've now come back from the festival or they uh, are the, the leading authorities of the synagogue, although it's hard to believe that they would not be um, at uh, temple. Gloria. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, they are all Jews. Uh, the term for the Jews in John is going to be those who disagree or are in conflict with Jesus and his teachings. Okay, so there are going to be some Jews who are uh, on board, right? And then there are going to be other Jews who are in conflict with Jesus. Yep. And some that are, yeah, uh, have no clue. Good point. Okay, so we've got Jesus, the disciples, the crowd, and the Jews, right? That's everybody. And I suppose we could say God the Father who is at work, right? And uh, Jesus is going to defend uh, God the Father, okay? What is the setting? Uh, go ahead, Connie, say it again. You were muted. Oh, sorry. The other side of the sea. It was the opposite side from where they were. Yeah, so at one point they're over on the east side and then they go back to the west side, right? So the east side is where the miracle happens. The west side is where uh, they're hanging out. Yep, and they're, they've all come back there. It's the day after the miracle, the yeah. sign, okay? It wasn't that long ago. It wasn't like, Oh, remember back 15 years ago when Jesus did that one sign? No, it was it was just yesterday. Okay. And what's the mood? They're grumbling. Well, they're they're grumbling. Uh, yep, they're trying to make sense of what this is all about. There's a sense of excitement too, right? Like, oh Jesus, when did you get here? Man, what you did yesterday was kind of cool, but we don't even understand what that's all about, you know. So there's, uh, there's a couple of pieces here, okay? What are the dilemmas that are showing up? What are the dilemmas that are showing up thus far? They, they need signs continually, it seems like, to be able to, I mean, they're asking for um, another sign or, or what sign do you do that that's what they're looking for is signs yeah they're asking for signs and the role of signs is always to point to jesus right that's right. what we understand um i think it is a guy by the name of barrett uh what is that what is it that he says about it the sign of the loaves quickened the appetite but not their faith right i love that line it yeah. quickened their appetite but not their faith so they're asking for signs it's as if they've already forgotten about the feeding of the 5,000. Yep. Which means, too, that their faith may be based in just wanting a miracle, but not necessarily receiving Jesus as the, as the Messiah. Okay? 
What's another dilemma? Pam. Yeah, they're they're trying. Uh, what Pam just said is that the law was so ingrained in them that now they've heard a different teaching or they have a different uh, understanding that's coming to, but they don't really fully comprehend it. So they're trying to get a better understanding of who Jesus is, what he's bringing to the world. And what it is is so different from what they're used to. Yeah, that's great. Claire. Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And, and that wasn't the official scenario, but now it is. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. The crowd is needing the signs and wonders. Yeah. Yeah. The, the man, the official, sort of submits to God's power in Jesus Christ, right? Just come before my son dies, right? And he gets both life and faith. And here, they just want the signs. They don't want the life and faith that come with it uh, in Jesus. Yeah, great point. It Good. seems like Connie. Trying, it seems like they're. It's all about a physical hunger. Um, yeah. All their stomachs, but. Yep. Not understanding about the bread that he's the spiritual bread that. Yeah, this is not the first time in John's gospel that Jesus uses sort of a physical reality to uh, explain a spiritual need, right? right. Uh, it, you remember the Samaritan woman, give me a drink, right? And then it's about living water. Well, how are you going to get this living water? Because you don't have a bucket. And it goes back and forth, right? They don't understand. Uh, Nicodemus, right? Well, I can't crawl back into my mother's womb. That'd be painful and terrible, and I'm not doing it. Well, that's not what I'm talking about, Jesus says. It's a birth that's given to you from above, right? By God's power. So Jesus uh, is always speaking in the world, but we don't understand that the world itself, created by God, is also bearing witness to who Jesus is and what he is doing among us. It's so remarkable. Um, I, I, I think it's Eugene Peterson. I don't know this for sure, but I think it's Eugene Peterson who says, um, we see a rainbow and yet we miss the artist behind the rainbow, right? We see it a hundred times and we, we, we don't even glimpse the glory of God by seeing a rainbow. What a, what a novel uh, reality, right? That's so self-absorbed, really, that we miss the creator. Yep. Any other dilemmas that you sense thus far? Yeah. Yeah, I think there is. They they are grumbling because they want to go back to the way it was, right? We ate out of the flesh pots in Egypt, right? And here, all we have is this crummy manna. Yeah. Um, and they also don't understand that that is the way that God is sustaining and nourishing them for the journey, right? Um, and here, they've had their stomachs filled, but what happens? You wake up in the morning and you need your breakfast again, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the other thing that's sort of happening here is that uh, they're hungry and they just need to fulfill their appetite mm -hmm. yep and, and yeah and just enough for that day yeah that's a great insight that's a great insight gene she says well god only sent enough for that day so of course they're coming back to jesus saying hey we need some more we need a refill you know it's a new day today come on uh that's a great that's a great insight so maybe they do come 
sort of with a sense of wonder. Uh, uh, maybe it's even faith filled. Okay, we ate our fill today. Now where's our fill? Or we ate our fill yesterday. Where's our fill for today? Yeah, that's a great. Yep. Yeah. And the next thing that comes with that, right? And the other thing that's kind of important is that Torah was often referred to as bread, right? So it's, we heard your teaching yesterday. We saw it yesterday. Now we've come for our teaching today. What are you going to show us today? Yep. So it may not be that these, these are sort of bullheaded, ignorant, grumpy Jews. These are just people who are really intrigued and they have really caught on and, and see this new thing that Jesus is doing uh, that's in vain, in line with everything that the Old Testament God did. And now he's doing the same thing here. And we want to see that and, and be a part of it. Great. Great insight, friends. Pam. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. 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 The basic needs, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs says we need our basic needs met first before we can move up the up the pyramid or up the ladder uh, to those things like transcendence. Right. Uh, yeah. That's that's really good. Right. I really love that insight, uh, Gene, that you bring. That's really helpful. Yeah, maybe they were. Didn't some of them try? Yeah, they tried to hoard it for the next day. Yeah. And then it turned into, you know, maggots or whatever. Yeah. Good. I, I really like verse 37. It's such a promise. 37. All, verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Yeah, what a word, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Connie, will you take us through uh, 35 to... Oh, I, okay. That's okay. You're, you're making the That's same thing. Right. Moving on, people. Okay, uh, let's take a look. This is now the discourse, right? I am the bread of life. Okay, so there's Jesus the Savior with the Eucharist, okay, I am the bread of life. Will you read 35 to 51, please? Okay. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall not never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my father, that everyone who looks on the son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God, or he who is from God, he has seen the Father. There you go. Truly, okay, how far am I supposed to go? 51? Yep. Truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. 
If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. <laughs> right? Now this is the discourse. So this is Jesus explaining everything. This is Jesus helping to put into context what does the feeding of the 5,000 mean? What does, uh, what does the walking on the water for the disciples mean? Okay. Uh, what does the conversation about Moses and the bread come down from heaven mean? Now, Jesus is giving it all very clearly to us in this explanation. Now, as Connie was reading, I was listening. There's another one of those threefold refrains. Did you catch it? I will raise them up on the last day. And we heard it three times. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think John's on to something here, right? Mm -hmm. But of course, you know, these, these gospel writers, they're just simpletons. They didn't really, you know, <laughs> lay this out or try to put this together in any way. I, yeah, right. Okay. There we have it again. Your son lives, your son lives, your son lives. That's what we heard last week. And now today I will raise him up on the last day three times. Good. What else? Uh, what comes to mind as you hear these words that Connie just read? One thing, you know, where we were talking about the Trinity, and you can definitely see that the Father and the Son are in sync here, and, and Jesus does the will of his Father. So, yeah, there's no, you can't separate them at this point. That's right. Uh, J uh, John has a real distinct understanding, right, of the unity of the work of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And uh, Jean, it's important, you, you said sometimes we forget about the Holy Spirit. But if you remember back to John chapter 1, John chapter 1 said, uh, this was John the witness who said of Jesus, I saw the Holy Spirit descend and remain on him, that the spirit abides uh, with Jesus, that Jesus walks around um, with the Holy Spirit in or on or around his very being, okay? Uh, John chapter one, uh, I saw the Holy Spirit descend and remain on him, abide with him, okay? So it is, it's all three of them doing this work uh, at the same time, really good. Other insight, Claire. I say it's pretty interesting how it moves from you know the twelve people uh, where they're they're hearing him, they want the bread all of that. They're yeah. giving the bread all of that. Now the responding people actually he's explaining are the Jews. Yeah, the grumbling Jews who are in opposition to Jesus. Yeah. It yep. makes me wonder about all of the rest of the crowd because the ones grumbling are probably a few. Yep. You know, yep. As they as it always is, right? The grumblers are few, but they're the loudest bunch, right? Yep. So anyways, I just had to put that to I I love how we have um, the last couple. Yeah. All of those that are working. Right, right. Um, so I want to respond to both things that you said here, um, that earlier you mentioned that Jesus is the judge and he begins to speak and all of a sudden there's a revelation. There is a revealing the light has come and those who believe what Jesus says are in the light and they're happy about it and they're full board. They're on board. They, sir, give this bread to us always. Jesus continues speaking, teaching, revealing, and uh, the light has come, the teaching is declared, and now the judge is revealing those who are in darkness, in unbelief, who are outside of, uh, and are actively rejecting Jesus, saying, we can't have any of this. How can he say this? This is impossible. Yeah. So um, Jesus isn't judging them. Uh, saying, oh, you're terrible people because you don't believe me. He's just saying it, and all of a sudden, boom, it happens, right? Um, that's a really profound uh, reality, I think, um, the way that that sort of manifests itself. 
as we heard in, uh, what is it? It's uh, John 3, 19 to 21, right? And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and the people hated the light because their works were darkness and evil, okay? So that's one thing. And then you said, this is the Eucharist. This is, this is Holy Communion. This is uh, the Lord's Supper happening right here. Which is Passover, yes. Uh, yep, it's exactly right. Uh, Jesus institutes the Passover uh, or institutes the uh, sacrament of Holy Communion on Passover. What's interesting is when we get to Holy Week, Jesus is not going to institute a Passover uh, or, a, or a sacrament. It's already done here in chapter six. Okay. This is another thing that is particular to John. John does something different on Holy Thursday. Because in, can you believe it? Uh, two years before he's going to die, or at least one year before he's going to die, he's already handing over the sacrament, right? Mm -hmm. And um, what is the sacrament good for? It is for life and the promise of the resurrection, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, if you go back, uh, taking a look at verse 11, John chapter 6, verse 11, you have the uh, words, right, of institution right there. Uh, in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed them. Mm -hmm. See that? Mm -hmm. So crazy. Okay? So uh, this is happening right now. Jesus is giving us the sacrament here. Okay, and as uh, as we pointed out, it is good uh, for being in relationship with God. It is good for uh, feeding, sustaining, nourishing, and lastly, it raises us up on the last day. That's what the sacrament is good for. Okay, only Matthew and Paul talk about. Uh, the forgiveness of sins. Uh, Mark and Luke and John leave that out of their understanding of the Eucharist, but they are pointing to it. Um, Matthew is the only one who actually says the forgiveness of sins, right? The, the, my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. So there's, that's why in Luther's explanation to the sacrament of Holy Communion, he says, where there is forgiveness of sins, there is also what? <clears throat> Life and salvation. Okay. Also, it, it looks like they're having a really hard time with Jesus as a man being able to claim to be actually the son of God. Be, because, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's yeah. a great point, Connie. Uh, there, there is trouble here in trying to understand the incarnation. Right. How is it that the invisible immortal god can inhabit the mortal visible human body of jesus right, right? and that's going to be a problem i think um this is the same argument that lutherans run into with the sacrament right mm -hmm. well it can't really be the body and blood of jesus because it's only bread and wine and divine things can't inhabit uh Eter uh, earthly things, right? Mortal things, physical elements. Well, uh, right here, Jesus, and uh, especially in the next uh, section, uh, right? There, right um, where is it that he says, you know, this is the flesh and blood, right? Um, yeah, in 53, he's going to say, truly, mm -hmm. truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you, okay? So uh, this is a, a, an incarnational declaration. It is that Jesus is both human and divine. Yep. And the gifts that he gives are physical, right? As we heard in the sermon yesterday, it's physical creaturely life and it's spiritual. 
life of faith, and eternal life. What's interesting is that right now you experience physical life and uh, life in faith, and that's here. And then uh, in, the, in eternal life, they're going to be perfectly blended together, right? Your physical life is going to be restored, and you are going to live in perfect relationship with God, and you aren't going to need faith anymore because your faith will have become what? Sight, okay? So you see God uh, finishing this up for us, okay? Yeah, yeah, if if let's just take a look here at verses 53. I read 53 and 54. Go to 55. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. To live with, right? Now you're in when you eat the flesh and blood of Jesus, you abide in him just like the spirit abides in him. Okay, as the living father sent me and I live because of the father. So whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread that the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And Jesus said these things in the synagogue around the time of the Passover. Okay. As he taught at Capernaum. Okay. That's what it means to be the bread of life. Right. Let me just say uh, two more things. Well, three more things about that. Notice uh, in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That when they do the feeding of the 5,000, it's all the disciples doing the work. Here, it's all Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus sees the crowd. Jesus says, what are we going to do to feed those people? He asks Philip that question intentionally to test Philip because the scripture even says he knew what he was going to do. Okay. And then he takes the five loaves and he distributes it to the people. He gives it out to them, not the disciples. The disciples are the busing crew. They are on cleanup duty, right? They have to clean the kitchen and take out the garbage and make sure that everything is back in tip-top shape for the next day. But Jesus is the provider, the one who gives us the life and the things that sustain life, including bread and water, food and clothing, shelter, all those things, okay? This is why he teaches us to pray for daily bread. It's that simple. It's those simple things. But then Jesus is the host, right? And you have a good host. When the host makes sure that your plate is full of really good food and that there's enough to go around, more than you could ever possibly eat in one sitting, right? He makes sure that the wine glass is full, right? And it's abundant. It's never running out, right? Interesting that we have bread and wine in the two signs. Eucharist, the, the, the sacrament there, okay? And Jesus is the one who gives life through the eating his, eating his flesh and drinking his blood. We literally receive the, bo the bodily need, right? sustenance nourishment it's kind of unfortunate that we use such small wafers and such small cups right uh this is a meal that's supposed to feed you right we should be br breaking off big hunks of bread and having big glasses okay and then uh he gives the life that sustains your faith and this food promises to raise you on the last day Jesus is the giver of life, all three kinds of life, okay? This reminds me of the vine, the story of the, you know. Yeah. The, the sun, you know, we're, at, we're attached to the vine. Jesus is the vine. Yeah, and, 
And that's John 15, right? And apart from me, you can do nothing. Right. Yep. Right. That's great, Connie. Yeah, John 15. Um, and how we're attached to the vine. I'm taking notes. Okay. Um, let me just offer one more reflection on this. This is from my teacher, Caroline Lewis. Did you catch where they're sitting down? On much grass. Did you catch that? Yeah. Uh, Mark says green grass. John says grass. Matthew and Luke don't even mention the terrain. Isn't that interesting? Okay. Uh, Caroline Lewis says this. This description alludes to and foreshadows the presentation of Jesus as the good shepherd in chapter 10. The pasture for the sheep signals provision and abundance of life. I came that they may have life and have it in abundance, John 10, 10. And this abundance is clearly present in the feeding of the 5,000. We are reminded once again that abundant life can be as simple as the basic necessities of life. It is abundance reconfigured through the concept of a relationship. Okay? Life cannot be abundant if it is not grounded in an intimacy and a relationship and security. Think about a mother feeding her child, right? The child comes to trust the mother because uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is met, right? Okay. Abundant life cannot be felt or experienced if the knowledge and promise of provision are not assured. Abundant life is predicated on the human necessity of dependence and reliance. Above the minimal needs comes abundance and the ability to thrive. That's Maslow right there too. It's crazy how he's coming back all the time. And then she goes on to say this. Jesus himself feeds the crowds. Contrary to the synoptic gospels where the disciples are given the loaves and fishes, it is Jesus alone who meets out the food. Robert Kaiser points out that Jesus is the giver of essential nourishment of humanity, acting as the typical Jewish host. This underlines the emphasis of relationship, right? You don't go to somebody's house and eat off their table unless you know them. Make sense? Not only is Jesus the source of abundant life, but it is in being in relationship with him that is the source. Abundance cannot be separated from Jesus. So Connie hit it on the head when she pointed us to John 15. And apart from me, you can do nothing. You are nothing. You have nothing, right? You can't even bear fruit uh, unless you've got that, okay? Uh, you may remember uh, back when we were talking about Nicodemus and we had, we were trying to get a, uh, an understanding of what belief was or the gift of faith. And Connie reminded us that it's all about uh, God's work, right? It's God's initiative in us. And I think you get that in verses 36 and 37 tonight, right? Uh, John chapter 6, uh, 36 and 37. I said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. Okay. Jesus comes from the Father, the Father shows us the Son, and we should believe, and we don't, okay? And then in verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. It is God's initiative to create the relationship with Jesus, right? And once God does that, you're never cast out. Jesus has you. That's another reference to John chapter 10, when Jesus is going to explain that he's the door for the, sh the, the gate for the sheep. And you only get into the pen through Jesus. And he's also beating the wolves who are trying to come in and the thieves 
who are trying to snatch, steal, and destroy. Okay? What a gift, right? That's who Jesus is. But those verses, I think, cannot be divorced from verse 44. Okay? Where God's initiative is also an invitation. Okay? No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Therefore, that's what that truly, truly kind of means here. Verse 47. Four, uh, 47 says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. Okay? Does that maybe help to kind of clear up the muddy waters about belief uh, and uh, faith and how it's a relationship, right? It's an invitation to come to the table, right? That's really what's at stake here. You want, you want the, the food that gives you life? You, wanna, you want eternal life? Well, come to my house for dinner. I've got what it, what it takes, Jesus says, right? And it's the father who sends the invitation. Go to my son's house. He's got the goods. Get there. You don't want to miss out. It's really good. Okay. I like to think, or at least, and and you you get an invitation, and if you miss him, God, he keeps drawing you. He just yeah. doesn't let go. Yeah. You know? So that's uh, why Jesus keeps keeps teaching, right? right. Uh, this is only chapter six. We've got how many more chapters to go, right? right. Yeah. God keeps knocking on that door, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, it, it even uh, even there is there is a, a human element to faith, right? There is a human element to belief, right? It's a simple yes and no. You're you're either going to be in relationship with Jesus or you're not, right? I'm going to go to the I'm going to go to the table or I'm not. I'm going to go to church on Sunday morning, or I'm not. I'm going to open the scriptures, or I'm not. This is how we are in relationship uh, and being in relationship with other believers, right? That's what Jesus is doing here, too. He's not just gathering you, right? It's not just, but he's gathering all people to himself, mm -hmm. right? That's the gift that's given. So it is. Uh, it is as simple as saying, I, uh, uh, I'll, I'm coming to the party. I can't help but come. Uh, I'm just totally captivated by the invitation, right? And it may be, as we heard early on, uh, that they were just intrigued. Well, I got some yesterday, and now I'm here for my fill today. But it also is, uh, in a sense, drawing us to that something deeper, that bread that is both life that nourishes and sustains us here and leads to uh, the resurrection on the last day. Okay. In John's gospel, this is uh, Robert Kaiser who says this, believing, hearing, seeing, and knowing are all closely related in John's usage, and they all indicate an ongoing relationship with Jesus. Okay. Jesus keeps drawing us and gives us another opportunity to believe, to hear, to see, and to know him. Okay? John appreciates the mystery of the process of believing, recognizing that human will is essential, right? Now, uh, but it's impotent without God creating the, the powerful uh, faith that we have. That's... The fact that God is teaching us in Jesus Christ, all people will be taught by God, is an absolute invitation to believe and is considered the redemptive intention of God in Jesus Christ. To come to know God, you must know Jesus. And to come to know Jesus, you must know God. 
And so the conclusion is that only God's power can initiate faith. Wow, isn't that, isn't that beautiful? That's cool. Well, something happens. Did you, did you see how it ends? Have you read ahead? Take a look at John uh, 6, beginning at verse 60. Okay. John 6. <laughs> they take off. You're exactly right, Pam. Uh, they just can't stomach it any longer, right? So let's take a look. Many of the disciples heard it, and they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? If you can't handle the bread come down from heaven, you aren't going to be able to handle the ascension of the Son back into heaven. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Anybody hearing the words from John chapter 4? You will worship me in spirit and truth, right? Okay. But there are some of you who do not believe. That is, you are not in relationship with me. You, you have decided to actively reject my invitation. Okay. You, you can't grasp this and you won't. Uh, I kind of think about, um, you know, the, the active atheist, right? Or the, what do we call them now? The nuns, right? N-O-N-E-S. I don't want to have anything to do with that, right? They have decided that they're not going to live in community with the church and they're not going to be in relationship with Jesus. They have rejected it altogether, okay? Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. It's not a surprise to Jesus that some uh, ultimately do not come to faith, okay? We, uh, what can we do in that? We can keep sharing. We can keep praying. We can keep inviting. We can keep confessing, but ultimately faith is God's work, and that's uh, it's up to him, okay? So you just have to leave that be. This is why God is God and you are not, and it's, that's painful, stressful, annoying, uh, bothersome, uh, but it, <laughs> it is to trust the first commandment, to fear, love, and trust God above all things, including your Ability or inability to convert people, <laughs> right? Ooh, what a gift. Uh, I'm Somehow my shoulders feel a little lighter now. Okay? Right. But then let's keep going. Uh, verse 65. This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. Promise that Connie pointed out in verse 37. Mm -hmm. Well, Pam got it right. Verse 66. After this, many of the disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. They gave up. They rejected the invitation. They said, this is too hard. It doesn't make sense. And by the way, I'm not interested in what you're selling. So they left. And Jesus gets a little nervous. He turns to his disciples and says, well, do you want to go away as well? And listen, this is what faith sounds like, okay? It's this is the response to an invitation that says, aha, <laughs> right? Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. That's Peter saying, Jesus, you have got what we need and we're not going anywhere. And that's the difference, right? That's the difference between darkness and light, unbelief and faith. It's to have everything given to you in Jesus Christ and to say, oh, I got to have that, right? That's what Jim Nestigan says, right? Oh, give it to me. Um, 
you can't help but get it. And Jesus yeah. answered them, did I not choose you? Did I not choose you? And then we have even among them, Judas Iscariot, who will betray him. Okay. So Peter ultimate, oh, go ahead, Connie. Peter confesses the Christ more than once then. He's yeah. confessing. Um, Cause he did it. Um, it was at late, it, or maybe that was just in another gospel. It is in another gospel, but it's uh, in John chapter one, you have that, uh, that run in, right? Uh, that Andrew comes and tells him, we have found the Christ and Christ okay. points him out and says, well, you're going to be Simon, uh, son of John, but you're also going to be Cephas. Yeah. You're thinking okay. of, uh, you are the Christ, the Holy one of God from Matthew 16. Oh, right? okay. They're related. Okay. They're certainly related. Um, but here you have it in a different way, but G it's this sort of the same scene. Maybe okay. uh, Matthew heard it one way and John heard it another. I don't know while they were standing there. Okay. It's when Jesus says, who do you say I am? Yep. That's the one Matthew 16. Yep. yep. Okay. And, uh, I think it's Mark, Mark nine, maybe Mark 10. Uh, okay. Somewhere in there where that. Okay. Was. Okay. So uh, the last thing then is uh, Peter's statement. Do we join him? And when you do, you know that the spirit dwells in you, that the father has summoned you, called you, demanded that you come to the one who has eternal life and that it is for you. What good news. What good news. Uh, Gloria. And you covered every crowd you got a lippy one. And that's Peter. Yeah. Because he gets into trouble with that a little later on. But it yeah. seems to be the, the lippy one crowd. Yeah. He gets it right here. He yeah. gets it right here. Yeah. And he's going to be the one. Uh, and, and yeah, it's possible that he doesn't even know what he's saying, right? Or what that fully is going to mean. Right. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's probably true for a lot of us. Right. But it still is a confession of faith. Mm -hmm. uh, you to whom shall you go to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And indeed, you are the Holy One of God. Uh, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for your gifts. For life in our heart and breath in our lungs for the food that has come down from heaven, like rain falling from the sky, creating grain, grain ground up and becoming our bread. So also, Lord, we acknowledge that you are indeed the source of this bread from heaven, a bread that meets our daily needs, both in physical and spiritual ways. And that this bread is also more than we can comprehend. That even as we take it, our sins are being forgiven. That there is life and salvation in it. And that we will be raised up with your son on the last day. Heavenly Father, help us by the power of your Holy Spirit and the continued relationship that we have with you. To join Peter and all the saints, martyrs, and every people of every time and place to say and confess, to whom shall we go? We're going to come to you, for you have the words of eternal life. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our crucified and risen Savior. Amen. Amen. Uh, tomorrow, uh, next week, uh, I'll ask that somebody lead us uh, in an opening prayer. Uh, great praying so far. I love it when lay people pray. It's not just the pastor's job, right? Uh, you all can do this. And then we're going to take a look at John chapter 7, okay? Uh, this is going to be a confrontation. So everything that's kind of coming to a head here is really going to blow up now uh, in John chapter 7, okay? There's going to be a confrontation. There's no way that we can get out from underneath it, okay? Uh, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.